Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Motive, Social Motivation for the Creative Class. I'm your host, Tim Fulton, here with artist, writer, wrestler, wrestler, Kent Grossweiler. Please welcome. How's it going? Good, good. Full Am I blushing? I feel yeah, like you look, you look, like a little I, flushed from the attention. I was trying to like come up with like, you look like, mm, right now. And really it's just sort of, you're just like, mm, I'm just the happiest old lady you've ever met. Is that okay? So, yeah. It's not well, bad. There's a pleasant old lady. Yeah, I feel kind of giddy. Full disclosure, audience, we used to live together in uh, an old schoolhouse that was converted into artist studios and apartments a uh, few of which had bathrooms. Uh, you and I used to share, not together or at the same time, but a shower every, every day. Uh, and we had day jobs, and so we were up early. And we had day jobs, and we went to them and did those jobs. But uh, at night, it was, a, it was a beautiful space, an amazing space, but a weird, weird place to live. <laughs> uh, Kent, you are currently a college student, a recovering addict, a painter, a writer, uh, a wrestler in the Artist Wrestling League, a certified wedding officiant in the state of Ohio, a drummer. drummer. Oh, that was the next thing. Uh, what am I missing? I think you. I, Friend? Yeah, I, I think you got it. Dog owner. Dog owner. And if you forgot one, like, that's enough. Like, yeah, we, we can... may get to it. Talk about, first of all, talk about your background. Like the CD stuff? Yeah, let's do the CD stuff first. Um, similar to Robert, who was up here earlier, I started a business in high school. However, uh, it's not one that's, uh, like, really smiled upon by society and or the law or Uncle Sam and the IRS. Um, and I was just, like, out of control. But, like, for a long stretch, it was a successful business. But, like, I drank and I did too many drugs. But I did make... As a teenager. Yeah, as a teenager and as an adult until the age of 31. Um, you know, for a while, I made a lot of money until I took all the money from my business to give to another businessman down the street that... <laughs> Let, let's, I'm going to keep the joke going for just a little bit longer. Okay. Something you were passionate about. Yeah. 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 Something that you wanted to, you know, include in all of your life. But really what we're talking about is you were... A drug uh, dealer. You were a drug dealer uh, and a drug addict. Yeah. And an alcoholic. And an alcoholic. Uh, and you sort of had to hit the lowest low in order to pick yourself back up. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of back and forth and like in my early 20s I started realizing like things were getting pretty serious um, but I wasn't really willing to put the work in uh, I was more wanting to do something to clean up my little messes get everybody off my back and then needless to say I would start the same stuff back up again well and sort of make life easier for yourself if you will and I when we spoke before I said well what what was you know, what was it that brought you, I won't even say brought you back, because you, the entire time you were a functioning adult, you were an addict and a, and a drug dealer and doing bad shit to yourself and to others. Um, and I said, what stopped you? Was it the fear of death? And your response was, I didn't really care about that. I just didn't want to end up a person who was unable to function and have to live through that. Uh, and that was really a striking thing for me. Um, we're here today to talk about your art, though, um, to talk, talk a little bit about sort of the, the painting that you do. Um, I always say I was tricked into being a painter. Uh, I loved high school art classes and grade school art classes. I dabbled some, like in drawing and, and doing stuff at home, but similar to most of the things that I did in high school, the more I started to drink and do drugs and, you know, carouse and run around, like all of that took over any other more, like, wholesome pursuits. And uh, 
2005, like it was early on in a friendship with uh, another fantastic local artist, Rob Jones. I can't say enough good things about Rob. Um, if anybody's not aware, like do yourself a favor, look his work up, you know, on Facebook, Instagram. He's a phenomenal painter, all around artist. And it was early on in our friendship and he and his wife just bought a new house and I was going over for a visit, figured, you know, he'd drink a couple beers, I'd have a cup of coffee or a soda, and we'd talk about music. We had a lot of common interest. He was showing me his new, you know, workspace studio in the basement, and he was like, I need you to paint the door. And I was like, no. Like, and, I well, and to be clear, he wasn't asking you to, like, do the trim or, like, or just paint it a different color. He was asking you to create a piece of art yeah, a on lar the door. Yeah, a very large scale, like artistic painting on the door. And, uh, you know, I had mentioned before, like um, playing in bands and, and working on songs and crafting the songs. And sometimes if some of my bands like practiced in a practice space with other bands, you know, if there were guys that were really good friends of mine and they wanted to pop their head in and listen for a minute, like no problem. Like we had history. But if it were guys in bands or ladies in bands like that I didn't know and they wanted to hang out and listen, I'd be like, no, you guys got to go. And I had mentioned that Tom Waits interview about certain people being in the studio and he was like, no, that's like people watching me take a bath. Right. You don't want, you, you don't necessarily, I think the adage a lot of people use is I'm not interested in showing people how the sausage is made. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just want to give them the sausage. Like no dirty pun intended, but yeah. <laughs> It's good sausage. <laughs> and so you have that experience where someone sort of brings you back to this thing that you experienced in grade school, in high school. Um, and then do you keep doing it? Do, is it, it, took, it took a little while. And uh, like the only reason I did it is I didn't want my brand new friend who I was just getting to know to think I was a huge jerk and like not want to hang out anymore. So I suffered through it and painted the door. And it was awful. It was like this, like, I didn't know how to do it. So I painted all the outlines, and then I colored it in. Like, it was a coloring book, and it looked like just this, re like a five-year-old tried to do a portrait of idiot-era Iggy Pop mixed with Carol Burnett. Like, it was heinous. <laughs> and uh, so then when I finished, and it probably took five visits to get it done, because it was big. He was like, now do the other side of the door. But I was, like, warmed up, like, if that makes sense, and, like, the paint, instead of looking very static, like I was starting to blend it a little bit, and it had some motion in it, and I was starting to ask him questions, and I was starting to look at his paintings like, oh, how do you make this look like it has form without uh, like a, a solid outline? Like, how do you do some shadowing, and how do you do some highlights? And it was probably another five years of only painting with him when I would visit, and at the end of the year, I'd have like a painting or two and in the middle of 2010, I just got obsessed and never stopped. And so what do you, what do you think his motivation was for asking you to do he's that? He's a natural-born teacher. Like, right now, he's an art school teacher in the Olentangy School District. And but why did he ask you to paint his door? Uh, this, I'm putting uh, you on the spot. We didn't, you know, we didn't I talk think about he, this before. If I were just to venture a guess, I think it was to, like, share something. And... Uh, you know, he wasn't teaching school at the time. He was in the process of getting his degree to be able to uh, be a teacher. But he was doing, like, a lot of work with, like, boys and girls clubs and, and disadvantaged youth and stuff like that. So I think it's just, you know, not only is it he a phenomenal artist, but he's a very phenomenal and natural teacher. And he probably saw... Uh, like a lot of my life has been people seeing things that I, I can't see and like something that's incredible, an incredible opportunity can be hanging out right in front of my face and I'll find a reason to do a 180 and walk the other way. And so, you know, I, I, I think he just knew. Like he just he knew. He, he saw something in you, obviously. Um, just to go back to the, you know, seeing the sausage made slash sit, having somebody watch you take a bath, I think it's interesting to point out that in your process, you don't want somebody to you don't want somebody to watch you practice drums. Correct. Uh, you don't want somebody to watch you paint. Both of which, though, are creating an end product for people to look at or for people to watch. And I just think it's interesting that that those 
those two artistic fields can be compared in that way. Talk a little bit about what actually inspires your, your, your art and your visual art and your writing. I know, like, from my earliest memories ever, like, I've always had an insatiable desire for reading, like, books, uh, listening to music, going to the movies. Like, for anything my parents did wrong, um, they did a lot of things right. And I probably went to see a lot of movies that I shouldn't have as young as I was. Um, but, you know, I saw tons of movies, like, you know, The Exorcist, Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder movies. And I'm talking like kindergarten and grade school. Um, most of the time, if there were R-rated movies and my mom didn't want to go, she'd take me and my friends and, and like buy the tickets. And I was encouraged to read and I read all kinds of stuff. And like my taste has always been huge and varied and I had two older sisters and both of my sisters and my mom and dad were always listening to music and all of their tastes were varied. And I just soaked all of it in and I think at some point, like, I just start, reg it's like I get filled to capacity and I regurgitate some of it out, like, with my own spin on it. And I think life experience factors in as well, and, and to some degree, um, maybe more so, obviously, to people that know me with the writing, because a lot of times, like, I probably think most authors, like, they write about what they know, and then they veil it in some capacity. And so you put it back out there into the world. And it's almost sort of a, a therapy to an extent. Even if it's a good positive thing, even if it's a, you know, a memory from a film or, so, or some minor aspect of a film, it's, it's sort of putting it back out there into the world. What um, you are at this point, a, you're a working artist. You're able to um, just do your work which is awesome. Mm -hmm. It's something a lot of people uh, strive for. I'm not making it rain, but I'm getting by and, and I'm grateful. I'm right, grateful. Well, I mean, you're paying the rent, right? And that's the biggest thing. I'm not very cooperative at like being at the same place 40 hours a week. Yeah, <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> Jobs are for suckers, that's the biggest secret. I wouldn't say that, but like uh, uh, my, mm. my hard wiring and what's required from somebody, I think it like, the 40 hour a week, nine to five, there's a severe lack of, of harmony. And sometimes I can only fake certain things for too long before I give very honest responses to questions that are asked. I think it's a, that's a very nice way to put it, that harmony doesn't last that long. What, um, what advice would you give to someone who is interested in being a working artist? Like what are, what did you run up against in terms of, I know that you've talked about sort of, you know, being good at balancing your time for shows slash commissions to like make sure that, you know, the bank account is staying flush, at least, you know, in the range that you're making rent at the end of the month. What, what how do you work? I think the two most important things, and like some of those things you're mentioning are very important too, but, uh, like very similar to Niall and Miko. They, they go for it and they ask questions and then they iron out and they stay open to learning, you know, and taking feedback. So like a lot of that stuff can get ironed out. Like the two main things that I would say have been huge for me are like work hard. And with that has been, you know, spending a lot of days, like 10 to 12 hour days painting and uh, in a row. Um, and I feel fortunate that I got obsessed with it enough to do that. Like, I'm a drummer, but like I would practice the drums, but would watch the clock a lot. It's like, okay, I'm doing these exercises to the metronome. And, and so, like, I'm not ever going to come close to John Bonham's status if I'm dawdling and screwing off and watching the clock. But that never happened with, with painting. But the other thing is, is like, be a decent person. Be accountable. Uh, be reliable. Um, be nice to people. Like, don't cop an attitude or be arrogant. Um, and sure, there's probably a lot of very successful, you know, artists, musicians, writers that are just straight up ass wipes, but uh, that, that's not what feels right to me. Like, um, and I feel very fortunate about that. Like, it, that's a product of being in treatment for six months. And uh, I think sometimes sitting in the middle of 
19 other treatment mates and a counselor here in what a son of a bitch I've been, um, I, I start, I, it started being important to me to be like a decent person and, and you know, to be honest and thoughtful and, and selfless and if somebody needs help, help them out. Um, if I told somebody like I was going to work something out with them for like a piece of art and you know, other opportunities come and, and it sets the, the date back a little bit and you know, I've been in a situation where somebody offered me more money to hurry up and get it done and I was like, nope, we made a deal, like I'll take, I'm sticking to our original deal, I'm going to get this done and you know, it'll take precedent right now. So it's fair to say that you would attribute your success to do the work and be a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Good. I mean, I think connections are important. Like connections are, have gotten me everywhere where I'm at career-wise. And uh, if I was showing my ass when those handshakes were made, like, I don't think I'd be invited back the second time. I think I agree with that. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Kent Grossweiler. <laughs>